I love the book of Revelation. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, but there are some difficult passages in the book. Uh, I mean, in the first 12 verses of chapter 9, a demonic horde comes up out of the bottomless pit. And um, I'd rather talk about the love and grace of God than these kinds of things, but it, they're there. And so we don't want to skip over any of those things. But if you would, you can turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 9. We're looking this morning at the first 12 verses and talking about the fifth trumpet. We've been looking at the seven-year tribulation period, which is about to come upon planet Earth, a time also known as the Day of the Lord. This seven-year tribulation period begins with the opening of the seven-sealed scroll, which is the title deed to the earth. And by opening the scroll and loosing its seals, our Lord Jesus Christ is proving his right to redeem this earth back to himself. This earth was lost in the garden, turned back over, turned over to Satan. But the first six seals bring the Antichrist war, inflation, famine, death, and tremendous cataclysmic upheaval, both in the heavens and the earth. The seventh seal introduced the seven trumpet judgments, which are worse than the seven seal judgments. The first four trumpets brought devastation and destruction upon the earth's plant life, marine life, its drinking water, and its natural light. And that brings us now up to chapter 8, verse 13, where we ended last week. But look at verse 13 of chapter 8. John says, I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Three more woes and they're terrible. A time of great judgment, worse than what we've seen yet. And I think to myself, what can be worse than what we've already seen, what's already happened? Well, whereas the first four trumpets brought physical destruction upon this earth, destroying the earth's ecology, the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments are now not just upon the earth, but upon its inhabitants. Demons from the pit are released upon mankind, and they are as wicked as they come. They've been incarcerated, held prisoner for thousands of years. It will be worse than if all the doors of all the penitentiaries in the world are opened all at once, and millions upon millions of the most vicious and violent kinds of criminals are released upon mankind. Only these are not mere men. They're demons from the pit of hell. It's like hell itself belching forth all of its corruption on planet earth all at once. Now, of course, all of these judgments are the judgment upon, of God upon this Christ-rejecting earth. But that's only one side of the coin. These judgments are also the grace of God, saying to the inhabitants of the, the, this earth, it's not too late to turn, reject the Antichrist and his mark, and turn to Jesus Christ before it's too late. And that's what we have here with the fifth trumpet, which is an opening of hell upon this earth with the purpose of persuading people on this earth during the tribulation. This is not a place you want to go to that you want to have anything at all to do with. You don't want to end up there. But in verses 1 and 2 and verse 11 of chapter 12, we have the leader of this demonic horde. Then, verse 1, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. And to him, now we know this star is actually a person, an entity, was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Many believe that this bottomless pit is actually in the center of the earth. And because the earth is constantly rotating, and if you're in that pit and you're falling, you never reach the bottom. Thus the bottomless pit. 
According to Luke 8.31, it's the abode of demons. It's where the wicked angels are incarcerated, and it's the final abode of Satan and his demons. Now look at verse 11. And they, that's this demonic horde, we're going to read about them in verses 3 through 10, had as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in the Greek he has the name of Polyon. Now we know that the star, the hymn of verse 1, is also the angel of the bottomless pit, the most powerful, the most dangerous angel that there is. Abaddon and Apollyon both mean destroyer. There's no doubt that who we're talking about here is Satan himself. In verse 1, John says he saw a star fallen that had fallen, is the idea, from heaven to earth. This star, this wicked angel, is the angel of the bottomless pit. Now, we know that it, from the book of Revelation that on different occasions, angels are referred to as stars. It's one expression. For example, in Revelation 1.20, the mystery of the seven stars, Jesus is speaking, which you saw in my right hand, these seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So angels there are referred to as stars. In fact, those seven angels are the ones that are blowing these trumpets. But the point is that angels are called stars in the Bible from time to time. This one had fallen from heaven to earth, and he has the key to the bottomless pit where all of these wicked angels have been incarcerated. It doesn't sound good for planet earth. In Revelation 17, 8, it says the beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit he goes into perdition so the antichrist there's something about the antichrist that's that's familiar there with the pit as well we also read in revelation chapter 20 verse 3 that the bottomless pit is where satan will be bound during the thousand year reign of christ upon this earth so he's not only a fallen angel but he's also the angel of the bottomless pit. Jesus talking to his disciples, the 70 that he had sent into the towns and villages of the area that day, they returned after sharing the gospel. And it says they returned with joy and they said, Lord, even the demons were subject to us in your name. He had given them that power. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning. I mean, this was drastic. Satan is a fallen angel. Not only the angel of the bottomless pit, that's where he belongs, but he's also a fallen angel. Now, if Satan is a fallen angel, then it implies that he was something special before he fell. For that, we go to the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, the questions asked, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you that have weakened the nations? Did you know he's the one pulling all the strings today behind the nations of our world, the wickedness that we see and the fighting and all of that? It's the enemy. But here how, here's how he fell. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, all the other angels. I will sit on the mount of the congregation of the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the clouds of heaven. I will be like the Most High. He wanted to take God's place. He was so full of pride. But before there was ever a rebellion which manifested itself in the gathering of other angels in heaven to his position and turning them against God, it was in his heart. It was pride. That's where it always starts. One third of the angels, we believe, fell with him, and we know them now as demons. Satan is a fallen angel. He's the most wicked one of all. We also have additional information from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, chapter 28 and verse 12. It says this, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and beauty, perfect. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, 
and emerald with gold. You can imagine how he looked. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. You were, past tense, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. Where did sin originate? With Satan. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within. You sinned, therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. Question, when was the king of Tyre ever in the Garden of Eden? Well, he never was. When was he ever the anointed cherub? Well, he wasn't. What God is, is expressing here, he's talking to the entity behind the, the kingdom of Tyre at the time, this wicked kingdom that was against his people, Israel. And the entity behind that was Satan, his influence in the world for evil. Now, we know that Satan is the angel of the bottomless pit. We know that he's a fallen angel. We know that he's fallen from heaven to earth. But when did he fall? Was it in Isaiah 14? Was it in Ezekiel 28? Was it in Luke chapter 10? Was it in Revelation chapter 9? Or is it in Revelation chapter 12? Listen carefully to this. Revelation 12, 7, war broke out in heaven. This is approximately at the middle of the tribulation period. Michael, who's the archangel, and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. That's another name for Satan. But they did not prevail, nor was their place found for them in heaven any longer. Up till now, Satan has had access into heaven. So great dragon, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth. Same thing was said in Revelation 9.1. And his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night. Did you know that he's accusing us even now? Has been cast down. And they, speaking of those that come to faith in Christ and are on this earth during the tribulation, it says they overcame him, meaning Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives to death. They're going to lose their lives for their faith in Christ during the tribulation. Therefore, O heavens and you that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come to you having great wrath because he knows that he's got a short time. Could this coincide with the fifth trumpet? It seems here that the fall of Satan from heaven to earth happens sometime near the middle of the tribulation and quite possibly coincides with the blowing of the fifth trumpet. And what we have in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Luke 10, and Revelation 9 is the moral fall of Satan from his place in heaven, his exalted position in heaven, because of his pride. And though he fell morally, still has access even today accusing us before the throne of God day and night. And what we have in Revelation 12 is the actual geographical relocation of Satan never to abide in heaven again to this earth cast down physically, not just morally. But right now, he's there in the presence of God. You see, Satan's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at one time. He's not ubiquitous. He is nothing like God. Look again at verse 1. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Satan himself does not have inherent power. He doesn't have inherent power. His authority was given to him. And guess who gave it to him? God. The one who's in control of everything. You know, people have this idea that, that God and Satan are fighting it out. And it's a good thing that God's a little bit stronger than Satan. That's not it at all. God has always been in control, and he always will be in control. And in this case, Satan was given the key to the bottomless pit. 
In other words, he didn't have it before that. Satan does not even have authority over the things that are under him unless God himself has allowed that. In fact, back in Revelation 1.18, when we were introduced to Jesus Christ and all of his heavenly glory, Jesus said this, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Jesus is in complete control. He has the key, and he gives it to Satan to open the bottomless pit during the tribulation. Jesus Christ is the one controlling everything. Satan's not the king of hell. He's its chief prisoner. Let's understand that. He can't do anything that Jesus won't allow him to do. Now look at verse 11. And they had as king over them, that's this demonic horde we're going to look at in a moment, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew was Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. The whole purpose of Satan is given here to us in those names. This demonic leader of these locusts, he's a destroyer. That's what he's about. Both of those words, Hebrew and Greek, mean destroyer. Satan is bent on destruction, the complete destruction of everyone and everything that God stands for. He's out to destroy every single human being to take their life before they have the opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ and be saved. That's his goal. And if you've been paying attention, he's striking earlier and earlier at our children, trying to destroy their lives before they have an opportunity to come to Christ. Why he's, he's, well, we're told to be sober, be vigilant, because our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's out to destroy our children. He's out to destroy our marriages. He wants to destroy your witness to, of, of Christ to this world. He wants to destroy us. And he claims not only the allegiance of billions of demons, but also millions of people who have chosen not to believe the message of the gospel. His purpose in Revelation 9 is also that of destruction. This is terrible. These locusts, they bring a terrible destruction. They carry out his purpose. He will destroy millions of people, even those that worship him. That's how sick he is. And he does it all because he hates the Lord. And I have to ask myself, I have to ask us, why would we want anything at all to do with Satan or his big tool against us, sin and pride? He's out to get us, but praise God that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Amen? Amen? Now let's look at this demonic horde, these creatures from the pit in verses 3 through 10. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. That's interesting. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. And in those days they will seek death and not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. So these locusts, they come right out of the pit, the bottomless pit. They're... they're a demonic horde, the locusts from hell. Wouldn't that be a great title for a movie? You know, they're making lots of weird movies nowadays. But this is the first woe. Remember, there's two others, as if this isn't wicked enough. But they're not normal locusts. Locusts do not normally have a leader. These are strange. They, locusts normally travel in bands with no leader, and they follow the wind currents. Now, throughout the Old Testament... Locusts are a symbol of destruction. destruction. Frequently, they were God's judgment upon wicked people. They breed in the desert. They, they invade the cultivated areas. The, the, what they are is sort of a mutation, if you would, of a grasshopper. A dry climate mixed together with the scarcity of food causes them to go through sort of a Jekyll Hyde transformation. Remember, this is after uh, the seals and, now, uh, and, and the first four trumpets where now the, the, a third of all the vegetation on earth has been destroyed. 
their bodies begin to elongate, their teeth sharpen, and they begin to migrate with other locusts looking for anything to eat. I found an old article about a town in Nevada called Winnemucca. You ever heard of that? <laughs> but this appeared in a Southern California newspaper years ago. Quote, four years of drought have left about 700,000 acres hopping with the now mouse-sized insects. In the 1930s, they invaded this area with such appetite that they actually ate the paint right off of the houses and the wooden handles off of all of the gardening tools. The infestation was so bad that several highways had to be closed. Only vehicles with chains uh, could travel and pass through. Uh, Roads are a favorite gathering place for these crickets because uh, their favorite food is other dead crickets and locusts. They're cannibals. They're hatched in the dirt uh, from eggs laid the previous summer. Uh, they grow to about the size of two and a half inches. They're protected from na their natural predators by a tough shell-like skin and these spines on their rear legs. At some point in the reaching of their maturity, they, they group together in bands of millions and become sort of erratic and military-like, marching across the country, eating everything in their path. Uh, these has not only happened in the United States, but it's happened in other countries as well. One man said that locusts uh, have been, or one article said that locusts have been known to grow as much as four to five inches. Can you imagine that? They fly in close companies in a formation so close that they look like a black cloud. That's exactly what was said here. They eat everything, leaving no food for either animals or humans. One man saw what he thought coming his way, a dark cloud. When it got close to him, it was locust. And it took an entire hour for that uh, swarm of locusts to pass over him. And it sounded like a locomotive when it went past. In the 1870s, the skies of Nebraska were darkened by a cloud of locusts 100 miles wide by 300 miles long and with an estimated 130 million locusts per square mile. Unbelievable. Is this what we read about here in Revelation 9, simply locusts or are they some kind of demonic infestation from the pit? Then out of the smoke, verse 3, locusts came upon the earth and to them was given power as scorpions of the earth have power. Again, only able to do what God is allowing them to do. The extent of their authority as it relates to time is five months. They'll torment men upon the earth. God says, you want to reject Jesus Christ and go the way of the devil and his demons? Then I'll show you what they're really like. I'll open up the pit for a little while so you can see what it's all about. Five months, they're going to wreak havoc upon the earth. They're limited not only by time, but also by what they can actually do. Look at verse 4. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, nor any green thing or any tree. That's God's grace. You know, you've already had the, the, the trumpets, which have destroyed one-third of all of this. But that's also the, the normal diet of ordinary locusts. But these are not ordinary but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The target is unbelievers. You know, God always separates His own. God made a distinction between Israel and Egypt with the judgments of, of Egypt. God removes the church before the tribulation period, and now God makes a distinction between believers and unbelievers during the tribulation period. This demonic horde will have no authority over anyone except those that don't know God. And they were not given authority to kill them, God's control again, but to torture them for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. I've only heard about scorpion. I wouldn't want to try it out just to see how bad it was, but I've heard it's like the worst kind of sting that there is, just tormenting type of, type of a sting. They're going to attack. Either the pain lasts for five months or they're constantly stinging the unbelievers on this earth for five months, whichever you choose, is not pretty. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. So death takes a holiday. Can you imagine that? You're, you've just been mutilated. 
by all that's gone on, and, 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 and you can't die, though. There's no release, no relief from this. Now, what actually happens, according to the Bible, when people die is the soul and spirit, which are the immaterial part of a person, are separated from the material part of a person, their bodies. But that's not going to happen here. God says, I, want, I, I don't want you to go to that place where that's going to be an eternal truth. I want you to try this on for size just in case. Can you, can you imagine this? Unbelievable. Jesus dismissed his own spirit. He's the one that's in control of this. He's the one that's controlling this. So though people will want to die, they won't be able to. The spirit will not leave the body no matter how hard you try. It's a foretaste of hell where the wicked are going to be tormented in their physical bodies forever and ever without the possibility of being set free. And God is saying to those, it's another opportunity to repent. Now, if you've received the mark, it's already too late. Turn to the Lord. All the way through here we see that. And the shapes, the appearance of these locusts was like horses prepared for battle. That word like, you see it throughout this chapter. It's a simile. The locusts arrayed themselves in an attack kind of formation. And, and someone said, is, it, is this possible that they're that size? Like horses? Could you imagine that? And on their heads were crowns of something like gold. And their faces were like the faces of men, resembled human faces. This is a grotesque picture of some kind of creature from hell itself. If not a demon, that perhaps a demon inhabiting some kind of an animal, making it grotesque. And the Apostle John is doing the best he can here to try and describe to us. And they had hair like women's hair, and the teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had a breastplate like breastplates of iron. Uh, the intimation is that they're very well protected. You're not going to be able to kill them easily, even if you, can't, if you could. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle, and they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Now, some have said that what these are are Vietnam helicopters. I'm not sure about that. Uh, whatever they are, they're the most grotesque kind of creature that you could imagine, and then they're worse than that. I think that it's interesting that a lot of the latest movies are picturing grotesque creatures with tremendous kinds of powers and all. Either people have very vivid imaginations or the movie industry is being influenced by guess who? Uh, And he doesn't wait till you turn 18 to try and influence you. I mean, have you gone down the toy aisle recently and seen some of the toys that are inspired by this whole thing? We've got to be careful with our little kids. Fallen angels, demon hordes, locust-like released upon the world, grotesque, really reminds us of what Satan is all about. You know, some people think, well, that's kind of interesting. He's a little wicked guy. You know, let's check him out, you know, and they're playing all these board games and doing these weird things and going, yeah, I'm just going to dabble in it a little bit because it's interesting. You know, all the stuff on TV, you're, you're watching it. Vampires and wickedness and all kinds of stuff, it's all over the place. None of this stuff is healthy for us. It's everywhere. And it's, and, and it's attacking our kids younger and younger and younger. This stuff is grotesque. You know, the imagery for what we have here in Revelation 9 is right out of the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse 4 says, their appearance is like the appearance of horses. And like swift steeds, they run with the noise of a chariot. Over the mountaintops, they leap like a noise of flaming fire that devours a stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people writhe in pain. They run like mighty men. They climb the, the, the walls like men of war. They march in formation. They do not break rank. They climb into the houses and into the windows like thieves. You do not want to be here for this. And the king over them, verse 11, was the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name means a, 
or his name in Hebrew is Abaddon in the Greek, Apollyon. Most conclude that these are some kind of demon locust here. Invading army, grotesque, that John has a difficult time even explaining. But what we have here is Satan being unmasked. You think he's some kind of a thing you can play with and dabble in and, and, and check it out just a little bit? No, this is wicked. Look at verse 12. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. God help those on earth. Remember, Jesus said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive. God's going to have to step in and, and, and stop this thing himself. The sixth trumpet, we're going to look at that next week, is a demonic army of 200 million soldiers just released upon this earth. Wow. Well, we who are born-again believers in Jesus Christ ought to be praising God that we're not going to be here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And those that are believers during the tribulation period will be praising the Lord because these demonic locusts cannot harm them. God's marked out His own. Not that they won't be killed by the Antichrist. That's, that's something altogether different. I believe that this fifth trumpet is a foretaste of what the torment of hell is going to be like. It's God saying to this Christ-rejecting world, don't receive the mark. Don't go this way. Don't be fooled by this stuff. Like, like Eve was in the garden. You know, as we continue to go cruise through the book of Revelation, we're going to see opportunity after opportunity by God. And then there's, I forget exactly where it is, but there's a place that says men on earth refuse to repent. It's sad. But sin hardens us. It keeps us from seeing. It puts scales over our eyes. We can't really see and understand what's going on. And those that receive the mark, we're, we need to tell everybody we know that doesn't know the Lord, don't, and under any circumstances, absolutely not, don't. Receive the mark of the beast. It's coming. Church is going to be taken out of here, and it's, it's a wonderful thing, but let's not uh, forego our responsibility to those that, that don't know the Lord. Amen? Yeah. yeah. Again, I'd much rather talk about the love of God, but uh, here's a loving God who's doing everything. I, I, I believe that that half hour of silence we saw last week before the trumpets started blowing is a hesitation, a slight hesitation on God's part because he knows what it means for those on the earth. He's so patient, isn't he? He's so long-suffering, willing, not willing that any should perish. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, only you know if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. That if you were to blow the trumpet taking the church out of here right now, that would be left behind. Only you know that, Lord. If you're here this morning and you're not sure where you stand, if the church was to be taken out right now, that you would go with the church Maybe you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've never confessed your sins, agreed with God that you're a sinner in need of his salvation. You've never reached out to Jesus and said, save me. Maybe there's a time you did and you never, it's, it, it didn't mean a thing. It wasn't real. There wasn't a genuine repentance of that. But if you'd like to receive Jesus this morning, and know absolutely that your sins are forgiven. You'd like to have the Lord clean the slate completely. He died for those sins. He died for our sins. And he loves us. But if you'd like to receive Jesus this morning, uh, with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, would you just lift up your hand? 
Praise God, I see one over here. God is so good. And I say this all the time, but more important than your hand is your heart. At hand is, is a first step in saying, I need help. I want to be with God in heaven. I want to spend eternity with, with those who believe I want nothing to do with this stuff we're talking about. Anybody else? Lord, thank you so much for the fact that you love us and care about us so much you tell us what is real. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.